title of my talk, Sit, Stay, Heal. This is the tide we rolled in on. An ice age landscape teeming with animals greater than us in every way. This was church. This was school. This was our homework. And we aced it. A million years of staring at animals burnt their anatomy and behavior into our brains. It showed us that the fiercest were more powerful as a pack, and even the most mighty were vulnerable when they were alone. These fellows here were the Steve Jobs and Bill Gates of their days. But something very important is missing from this picture, and it's these guys. These wolves had stared for us for tens of thousands of years, so we weren't the only gifted and talented creatures of the Ice Age. We now know from ancient DNA that wolves like this shared our caves, our, uh, our hunting grounds, and our trash. And that this wolf that was there with us is now extinct. However, it seems to have had the human intelligence and the social nervous system that made it calmer and more interested in developing social bonds with us. This is the wolf that would give us the dog, that would help us find the prey, and keep us safe from more deadly jaws. Neanderthals, apparently, did not have a way with wolves. And the way they're now thinking about that is because they're finding a lack of small bones in Neanderthal settings uh, at the end of the Ice Age, indicating that when the big game disappeared with the ice, they couldn't hunt faster, stealthier prey. For that, you need a dog. So their lack of a way with dog was probably their Achilles heel. This is a carnivore like no other. Our dog is the wolf that laid down with the lamb. It is the predator that does not bite. We came out of the Ice Age, changed animals too, with different ideas about who and what we could socialize with. War, warmer, drier times drove us closer together, and small clans turned into major cities. Uh, strangers became a creature called a neighbor. And the dogs that we still had with us, like ourselves, together we came into an agreement that we would take care of animals instead of hunting them. This is the creature that gives us an idea about the emotional and neural journey it takes to go from wolf to predator, from, in humans, from prey to predator to caretakers. That's a prairie vole, it's a very social animal, mates for life, takes care of its young, lives in large family groupings. Its cousin, the montane vole, looks almost exactly like it, but is a solitary animal only coming together to mate. The females alone take care of the pups and get rid of them the minute they're weaned. So very different social lifestyles. In the 1980s, scientists learned that those different lifestyles were mapped out very clearly in their brains and that these two ancient brain chemicals, oxytocin and vasopressin, write the social network in the brain that decides how social we will be. So on the prairie vole, you see those darker spots there. Well, that's making them, that robust oxytocin action is making them those highly social creatures that we saw in the picture. Without that kind of oxytocin and vasopressin support, you just don't have the urge to bond that way, and you act more like a prairie vole, and perhaps more like a Neanderthal. This is where we get our first taste of oxytocin, at our mother's breast. Suckling is releasing oxytocin in her brain. Oxytocin-rich breast milk is going to the baby, and the mother is filled with a sense of happiness that makes her want to hold that baby to her breast. It's an Evolutionary win-win, altruism, to give is to receive. Henceforth, for the rest of our lives, all pleasant social behavior will make us want to uh, connect with one another and nurture one another, which is why the cries of wolf pups in our camps would have made nursing mothers in the Ice Age do this, because this is how women have always fed hungry mouths for millennia. Our Ice Age mothers couldn't have known that when they were doing 
what came naturally. They were unleashing a powerful oxytocin bonding tide with some very special wolves. These pups would be keepers. They'd also help us fold in all these other animals into a large domesticated lifestyle, a powerful oxytocin feedback system that we all lived in for tens of th about 10,000 years. About 100 years ago, most of us still lived on, worked on farms. Some of us even became president of the United States. This is Harry Truman, and this is the agricultural sense and sensibility he brought into the White House. It was this leadership philosophy learned through his experience of the human-animal bond that he brought into the White House. That's very important. This is our new landscape. Uh, it is the high-rise tide that we live on, and it's pulling up social and neural roots that we laid down for 100,000 years. It also tends to make us very nervous. It degrades the soothing brain chemicals, such as oxytocin and serotonin. And for better or worse, this is the new homestead. This happens to be Hong Kong, one of the most densely populated places on Earth. Still, it's kind of interesting that 20% of Hong Kong's 7.2 million people manage to keep pets. Many of them little dogs that will never leave tiny apartments like this because they're not welcomed in the parks uh, because, well, you can imagine how small the parks are in Hong Kong. Anyway, we still want dogs at our side. We're never going to give up on that. So this is what you do. In Hong Kong, you take your dog to yoga, and you find out that yoga plus dog makes you more serene. In Brazil, where the party animals of the world, they find that dog plus carnival is even more fun. In Tokyo, you have popular kitty cafes. Um, and if you can't own a dog in Tokyo, you can rent one. Japanese own 22 million dogs. That's more pets than they have children under the age of 15. And who better to beat the rat race but this ultimate urban dweller? So we, these guys have always managed to get in where we didn't want them, but now millions of us are finding that rats can make affectionate and smart bonsai pets. So as rats tuck in, others are outliers are coming in to check out their urban options. Wolf-like dogs are riding the Moscow subways, and wily coyotes are showing up everywhere, even in Central Park. Might these become our new best friends in the future? Well, stranger things have happened, including finding ourselves surrounded by millions and touched by none. Our, our quest for friendship is in hyperdrive. We spend five hours a day looking at the internet in search of meaning and friendship. We have the option of 1.2 billion friends on Facebook, but the ancient brain wiring to accommodate or like 150. We're getting more nervous by the, sec by the second. We think, by the way, that we're always being watched. This is a new urban psychosis that's popping up. And we are always being watched. Facebook, Twitter, uh, iPhones, NSA, surveillance cameras. Our moves, every move is being checked. This dis-ease we feel is getting harder and harder to deal with because we're facing it alone. 300 million Americans live alone now. And even those that do form pair bonds, as they say in the Prairie Vole world, are electing to have families later than ever. So this kind of unsocial behavior for social mammals is very risky. And it may explain why 20% of Americans have psychosis, anxiety disorders, and panic attacks every year. And maybe why we have more dogs than anyone else in the whole world. If we're looking for a dog corrective, well, maybe we're correct. Because when you think about it, mental health care is either ineffective or very much unavailable. In contrast, we now know that in all, both of these scenarios, oxytocin is powerfully being released in everybody involved. 
And oxytocin isn't just a social bonder, it's a powerful anti-stress system. So, you're not crazy when you think that you're being watched, and you're not crazy when you think that your dog is your, is your baby. The latest studies now show that dogs do think we are their parents. We are their secure base, and more and more, they are becoming ours. Gregory Bates, uh, down in uh, Emory, uh, excuse me, Gregory Burns, he discovered the most amazing thing about dogs, that he could get one to sit still in an fMRI machine. And oh yes, he discovered that the happy centers of a dog's brain are the same as ours, and that what makes them happy, happiest is the sight, sound, and smell of us. Well, isn't that the description of best friend? So, uh, we, we're learning this, we're learning that dogs can see what we see. They do know what we want. This is the science that's breaking down the anthropomorphic brick wall that dared us to find human-like qualities in other animals. And yet, the closer we look, the more we find. And just when we're finding it harder to find human-like qualities in each other. And yes, our furry kids even look like us, all the way down to the genome. In 2005, uh, the dog genome was completely mapped, and lo and behold, we share a lot of DNA with our dogs. For 200 years, breeders have been manipulating that DNA in order to make the, the shapes, the sizes, the temperament, all those endearing qualities that we love. Well, in our quest for best of show, we also inadvertently bred in the capacity for, genetic capacity for cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. So it turns out that our purebred dogs happen to be pristine repositories of genetic maladaptions that lead to cancer, for instance. Now, we'll hear more about cancer later, but 14, thousand people, 14 million people died of cancer in 2012. So it's a very important thing to know. And so veterinarians and uh, human researchers have teamed up with anthropomorphic zeal to track down the genetic basis of cancer in dogs, because that will be the genetic basis of cancer in us. So once again, here's the dog, able to save our lives, this time from an enemy within. This is Ron. Ron is a young pup service dog on his way to being a service dog, and this is his um, trainer, who is a marine sergeant in treatment for PTSD at Walter Reed. Uh, he's uh, the marine sergeant's volunteered to be part of this innovative service dog training program Elise mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, called Warrior Canine Connection, that I'm uh, the research director of. It takes an awful lot for somebody suffering from debilitating trauma to have the focus and the timing and the patience and the joy to inspire a young dog to meet this challenge and to become this, this beast that we need them to be. So our trainers, warrior trainers, go out into public and they bury their own fears so that they can be confident leaders for these dogs that need to learn that the world is a safe place. While the dogs are learning it, so are the trainers. They're also learning the positive, nurturing dog training uh, uh, techniques that help them reconnect with their families. So it's been a very exciting program. And when you think about it, the pain of human betrayal. Well, of course dogs are going to be better medicine than humans. A dog is a soft, warm, loving thing that you can bury your head in until you get it right. And now we know that's not just a turn of phrase, but a neural reality. And we just got funding from the Department of Defense to study the physical and mental effects of the Warrior Canine Connection Program on the symptoms of PTSD, and it's our hope that we will be able to show scientific evidence that this works and move animal therapies into mainstream medical care. 
Can't talk about the Ice Age without talking about the other great animal that has always saved our lives, and that's the horse. The horse, when the uh, landscape disappeared, the horse almost went with it. But because the horse could change its stripes from an animal that was skittish and eaten by us into a brave creature that we could ride into the heat of battle, they made it to the 21st century. 8,000 years of horse manship is now being taken over by women. Women are writing the future of the human horse bond, and they're discovering kinder, gentler, and more amazing ways to be with horses, and ways that are highly therapeutic as well. Equine therapist Linda Kahanoff says, it's time to stare back into the herd to discover the social genius of horses, their collaboration, and their non-predatory leadership that can lead us into the 21st century. Biologists agree with her. They're finding that the fluid hierarchies found in swarms and herds and fish like this, schools of fish, creates a collaborative intelligence that's highly adaptive and highly sensitive and able to change with the environment. And that's what we're talking about right now is a big changing environment that we better get fluid on. So we're nowhere near done staring at animals. The closeness of how, how close we can look at them and how deeply we can bond with them will our lives still depend on it. Oh dear. And that was, <laughs> oh, there we are. It's always been the best of times and it's always been the worst of times. But this time there is a difference. We know too much. We cannot claim ignorance about how and why we create human-animal bonds. The future of the human-animal bond will be conducted with eyes wide open. Yes, we'll be able to make dogs that make us healthier, and that'll be terrific. They'll be healthier, we'll be healthier. And it won't be long before we can cherry pick that genome and create dogs with the temperament and intelligence to be the super support that we need more and more. But we will fail as a social species if we don't breed better humans. Humans with the hearts and minds to recognize a best friend when they see one. Fortunately, history tells us you can't change the heart of an animal without changing your own. So be the change and change the tide. Thank you very much.